actually on the second screen. No, no, not yet. Oh, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you you take a seat over there. Okay. I, I may just need to like check on. Uh, I'll yeah, be... I know, but don't leave for more than a minute or I'll be in, in trouble. <laughs> Okay, you can close the door. Uh, good evening. And thank you for your kind invitation. I'm sorry I can't be with you except, well, virtually. Um, but I guess that will have to do. Um, this, this is the first time in, I don't know, more than a decade that I've actually read a paper as opposed to summarizing, speaking just PowerPoints. But the fact is this paper is already so dense, it's unsummarizable. So I'm going to share the screen with you and give you things to look at, other than me reading my paper, which is not very exciting. And screen two, okay. I'm, okay, I'm sharing screen two. I will read the paper and show you a slide when it's appropriate. Well, it's appropriate already. This is my title, Water World, the Pluralistic Universe of Innocent Realism. That's my name and my email address. And this is where we are, the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Uh, I take as my text uh, a wonderful observation of Oscar Wilde. Truth is rarely pure and never simple. Metaphysics is, or at least by my lights, it ought to be, about the world. It's an a posteriori and empirical discipline. So metaphysical inquiry relies not just on reasoning, though of course it requires that, to make explanatory conjectures, to draw the consequences of those conjectures, and to check how well they stand up, but also on experience. Not, however, the recondite kind of experience needed by physicists, microbiologists, paleontologists, psychologists, etc. But on close attention to aspects of our everyday experience so familiar that ordinarily we scarcely notice them. This conception, I note, avoids both the long standing reliance of metaphysicians on the a priori method and the more recent scientific trend of hoping simply to borrow our metaphysics from currently accepted science. It's between a priorism and scientism. This is partly why I call my kind of realism innocent. It starts by telling you, it tells you to start by just looking, pay attention so far as you can without preconceptions. So it's innocent of such weighty claims as currently accepted science theories in the material sciences are mostly true. Moreover, this conception opens up the way to understanding how the world and we must be if successful inquiry, including successful scientific inquiry, is to be even possible. Without denying that results from the sciences may have contributory relevance to metaphysical theorizing. And at the same time, it explains how it is that metaphysics can seem to be a priori, even though it really isn't. We don't have to leave our armchairs to think metaphysically, because we already have the necessary experience. What is there, Quine famously asked long ago, as metaphysics was just getting back on its feet after the logical positivist Canard? that it was cognitively meaningless or at best bad poetry, and arsoned with characteristic wit, everything. True enough, but also characteristically unhelpful. Quine's subsequent formula, to be is to be the value of a variable, made matters, if anything, worse. Still, Quine's was almost the right question, except for his nominalist insistence on reading to be as to exist. What is real is better, but immediately raises another question. What exactly does it mean to be real? Quine would doubtless complain that like his fictional Wyman, who maintained that though Pegasus doesn't exist, nevertheless he subsisted, I am multiplying senses unnecessarily. 
But I think it crucial to distinguish reality, the more general concept of being, from existence, the mode of being of particulars. I adopt and slightly adapt the understanding of reality offered by Duns Scotus. The real is what is thus and so, whatever you or I or anyone believes about it. The core thesis of innocent realism is this. There is one real world, enormously various, and yet at the same time integrated, a kind of pluralistic universe. In this one real world, there are first physical, that's to say natural things, stuff and events, and physical kinds, phenomena and laws. These kinds, laws, etc., are emphatically not additional but abstract existent entities, but they're real nonetheless, as are the potentialities, the as yet unrealized possibilities, and the limitations involved in law likeness. This is not to suggest that our terms for kinds all refer successfully, or that the laws that we believe to hold are real, nor is it to suggest that everything is determined by natural laws. It is better expressed not as kinds and laws are real, but as there really are kinds and laws, though we may be wrong about what kinds and which laws are real. In our corner of the world, the Earth, which according to well-warranted current scientific theorizing, is just a tiny part of a vast universe, which is itself perhaps, according to less well-warranted scientific speculation, only one of many multiverses, there is also a vast array of human artifacts, physical, social, intellectual, imaginative, etc. To be sure, the universe is vast and there may be intelligent life elsewhere, in which case the richness of the one real world is even greater. But I focus here on the list of human artifacts, which is nearly endless and growing daily. It includes physical artifacts, Aqueducts, arrows, books, bombs, cutlery, clothing, computers, drains, dancing shoes, dongles, etc. Social artifacts, mating and marriage customs, systems of markets and money, religious, religions, educational systems, legal systems, the news media, the entertainment industry, scientific communities, scientific societies, big tech, social media, etc. Yes, these artifacts are socially constructed if that means there would be no such things but for what groups of people do. But socially constructed does not imply not real. Intellectual artifacts, languages, concepts, scripts, systems of numbering and measurement, musical and other notations, histories, computer programs, websites, apps, etc., and theories of every kind, scientific, philosophical, legal, etc. Imaginative artifacts, myths and legends, plays and poems, fictional characters, places and scenarios, pictures and symphonies, architectural designs, novels, cartoons, computer games, etc. Yes, there are real fictional characters, real fictional places, etc. But of course, these aren't real people or real places. I emphasize that this is just a very rough and ready classification for heuristic purposes only. These are nothing like separate kinds, let alone different levels of reality. Culture, as I might say, using the word in its broadest sense, is like an intricately and densely interwoven tapestry of many different colored threads overlaid on the natural world and everywhere enabled and constrained by its potentialities, powers and limitations. All those physical artifacts both explain and are constrained, both exploit and are constrained by the properties of physical stuff. You can't make arrows out of butter, computers out of grass, or bombs out of cotton. And all these different kinds of artifact are inter intimately interwoven. A system of money requires physical tokens of values, be it cowrie shells, banknotes and coins, or electronic impulses. The legal system requires courtrooms, law books, judges' robes, prisons, and 
languages, concepts, etc., and is the subject of a whole genre of novel and movies, the legal thriller. Think of all the paraphernalia involved in the 21st century wedding. The minister, the church, the flowers, the photographers, even these days, wedding planners' websites. Again, the sciences require all kinds of physical equipment to obtain their recherche observations. They need laboratories and, of course, fancy computing equipment, but they also require specialized vocabulary, notations, etc., the whole panoply of means of scientific communication and the imaginative constructions of scientists. And they, too, are the subject of novels, plays, movies, etc. Plays require theatres, actors, costumes, scenery. Novels require paper and printing, print, printing presses, or now their electronic equivalents. Paintings need canvases and paints. Movies need films, cameras, lights, and so on and on. I'm sure you can continue the list for yourselves. The distinction of nature and culture, moreover, is by now somewhat blurred because of the many ways we humans have altered the natural environment and the many plants, creatures, etc., that now exist only because of the human manipulation of nature. Now, this is all very well, you may be thinking, but haven't you simply taken mind for granted without argument or even acknowledgement? And doesn't that mean that you're covertly committed either to some kind of metaphysical dualism or else to a crude identification of the mind of the brain? Well, I prefer to avoid speaking of the mind as if it were a thing, almost another organ like the heart or the liver, let alone a place. It's better to speak of human mindedness. which has the virtue, being unfamiliar, of suggesting something more like a condition or a congery of functions and abilities. Yes, so far I have taken human mindedness for granted. But no, that doesn't commit me either to acknowledging mental as well as physical stuff, or to saying that the brain is all there is to it. Rather, I believe, human mindedness arises in a kind of virtuous spiral from the interactions of nature, individual, and culture. I first came to this conclusion in my, as in my capacity as epistemologist, I struggled to understand what it is to believe something and how what you perceive can change your beliefs, but then began to, to realize that this is just one instance of the enormously many and more complex com inter interrelated interactions we need to understand. Take a relatively simple example. Tom's believing, for example, that tigers are dangerous involves first his having a complex multiform disposition to behavior, verbal and other, to run away if a tiger is approaching, not to put his arm in the tiger cage at the zoo to feed the animals and so on, and to warn others if there's a tiger coming, and to assert or assent to, quote, tigers are dangerous and so on. This multiform disposition, second, is realized in some way in the receptors in his brain that register input from the world and the activators in his brain that prompt him to run away from a tiger, utter, watch out, a tiger, to assent to tigers are really fierce animals, and so on. Third, these dispositions to action and to speech or other sign use are associated in his brain with the same things in the world with which that vocabulary is associated in this linguistic community. This is, as I said, a relatively simple case. To include mathematical or theoretical beliefs or beliefs about the past, etc., would be one challenge. To extend the approach to other propositional attitudes, another. And to deal with emotions or self-awareness, harder yet. But even in this simple case, there's a complex congery of interrelated relations. There's, a three, there's the threefold relation of individual, words and linguistic community, and the world. But this threefold relation in turn requires the connection of receptors and, and activators in other people's brains to words or other signs and to things and events in the world. Nor, a normal human, human newborn has a brain all right, 
but a brain that hasn't yet developed the interconnections with word and worlds, world and words involved in belief, belief and other propositional attitudes. These will come very gradually as the child interacts with the world and those around it. And as it does so, it as it does so that the baby becomes minded, no longer just a human being, but a person. And in the aged, these connections may gradually wear out. Ugh. Alzheimer's can leave a sufferer demented, i.e. losing and eventually devoid of his or her mindedness. The growth of mindedness is thus, in a sense, inherently so social. But how is human culture possible, you may ask, unless people are already mind? Well, human beings are by nature capable of articulated vocalization, and we are social animals, not solitary, like cheetahs. The very smallest cultural developments, like the first sounds that come to be used and taken as warnings, contribute small developments of mind. And as culture gets more complex, so does mindedness. It's a virtuous spiral, as I said, and incidentally explains why I found it so useful at all to ask my students to make a glossary of all the new terms they inevitably learn in a course of mine which helps them think more sophisticated thoughts. And now it's time, mindful of the theme of this meeting, facing the future, facing the screen, to offer some brief thoughts on where virtual reality fits in. It's the so-called metaverse, as some may think, a whole other universe not even acknowledged in my metaphysics. No, of course not. Metaverse, like cloud storage, which is neither nebulous nor in the sky, is clever but misleading advertising. And virtual reality, if I understand it correctly, is a typically overblown word for a new class of computer artifact. Telephone enables me to hear someone far away. Television enables me to see and hear events far away. Zoom enables me to see and hear those far away people and so forth. And the virtual reality headset enables me to move around as if I actually were in another place. All very cool, no doubt, but not metaphysically startling. After all, for an additional sum, one can buy a headset that displays a little photograph of your actual surroundings in one corner, so you don't trip over the furniture or the dog. We know you can't have a real drink in a virtual bar or, or even on a virtual trip to a real bar. If like those business students who make a virtual business visit to a businessman in India, it's the visit, not the CEO in Delhi and his family, that's virtual. And for all the business school hype, you don't have lunch with your family, but at best eat your lunch here while experiencing something like being there. Actually, it wouldn't be your lunch. I think it would be your dinner from the night before or some such thing, anyway. But now I'm overshooting my word limit. If you need to know more, you'll just have to have your avatar call my avatar. Thank you. Thank you for your attention.